Good morning. Welcome to Wonderfest. This is uh, Wonderfest 2008, the 10th annual Bay Area Science Festival. My name is Brian Mallow, and I will be your moderator and host this morning. We have a really wonderful panel with two fantastic astronomers. I myself, I, uh, uh, I've never been an astronomer. I, I used to be an astronomer, but I got stuck on the day shift, which it kind of sucked. You don't discover anything good. My apologies to radio and solar astronomers who might think that's an offensive joke. So the tradition here at Wonderfest is to have two speakers in something of a dialogue. They will each present a case of sorts and separately, and then we will have them uh, engage in a dialogue, and then we'll also be inviting questions from the audience, which we encourage you to participate. Uh, this morning's panel is called, Why Do We Seem So Alone in the Cosmos? And both of our astronomers have dedicated their lives and their research to, uh, to discovering, a, uh, I guess not an answer to that question, but maybe to find out that we're not, hopefully find out that we're not alone in the cosmos. Um, Dan Wertheimer is the chief scientist of SETI at home. He's a researcher at UC Berkeley. Uh, he uh, has dedicated 30 years of his life, actually, to searching for ET. Hasn't found them yet, but he's not giving up. He's very optimistic, even as of this morning. Quite optimistic. SETI at Home, for those of you who don't know, it's the largest distributed computing program ever. It's very successful. When they uh, first launched it, they hoped that thousands of people would participate, and instead some five million people have downloaded the screensaver that, that runs in the background and uh, crunches data for the SETI program. So Dan will be up here in a moment to talk about his work. And his uh, compatriot is Jeff Marcy, also at UC Berkeley. Jeff Marcy is, his team has discovered more extrasolar planets than anyone else. They have discovered 150 of the over 300 planets that have so far been discovered circling other stars. So, pretty interesting panel. And I have a couple introductory remarks, uh, and then we will uh, introduce our speakers. Um, we would like to express our gratitude to the Cal Physics Department and to Professor Chris McKee. Is Chris here? Thank you, Chris, uh, for your department's hospitality and hosting Wonderfest here in Berkeley. Wonderfest's mission is to make science and scientists <laughs> accessible to the public. Together, Cal Physics and Wonderfest bring that mission to life every year. And uh, in between the panels, there is a expo, the Wonderfest Expo, going out just in that area, just outside these doors. And there are a bunch of wonderful uh, participants. There's artists and jewelry makers and at least one science comedian, um, which would be me, uh, selling a science comedy CD. I guess I didn't really introduce myself. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thanks, that's the traditional response on this planet. <laughs> a murmuring. <laughs> Sciencecomedian.com is my website and I have a CD for sale. And I will be sitting right next to um, the picture table. Picturu is making these Wonderfest Truth Flirter ID cards. And uh, stop by, I, I should show you the side that's actually the photo. Uh, they'll take your picture and they'll make you a little, uh, little uh, photo ID. And they're doing it for free. And if you, uh, for a small donation, there's other stuff you can get there as well. And these nifty uh, chains. The card personalized with your photo signifies that you're an official Wonderfest Inquisitor. Proudly wear it to show that you have been flirting around here. <laughs> All right, so uh, in order to move things along, I want to introduce our first speaker. And like I said, each of them will speak, then they will have a little bit of a dialogue, and then we invite questions from you. So we hope you will participate. And um, <laughs> in uh, keeping with the idea that this is a debate, we have uh, our first speaker will be Dan Wertheimer. He's the astronomer dressed in white. <laughs> Jeff Marcy, if you want to 
keep an eye on him. He's the astronomer dressed in black. We've got a little, uh, we've got a little good astronomer, bad astronomer thing going on this morning. So, as I said, please help me give a nice warm welcome to our first speaker, Dan Wertheimer, Chief Scientist for SETI at Home. Uh, thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, so, um, I want to tell you about SETI. SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I thought I'd start with a little bit of history of early ideas for how to get in touch with ET. Gauss, um, a mathematician, uh, thought that we should make a large geometric structure on Earth, uh, maybe a, a right triangle of pine trees, maybe three, four, five miles on a side, and then big squares of wheat and dirt and water, and then ET would look down with their very high resolution telescopes and see that we knew about the Pythagorean theorem, and then they would get in touch with us. It was a clever idea. It was unfortunately not funded. <laughs> the, von Littron suggested a couple hundred years ago that we dig a circular ditch 20 miles in diameter and then uh, fill that ditch with kerosene and then use this match not to scale to uh, <laughs> generate uh, a bright circle of light and then ET would look down perhaps using their sun as a gravitational lens you can make a spectacular telescope if you use your sun as a gravitational lens you can read license plates on distant stars anyway they'd see this bright, bright uh, ring of, of light and, and get in touch with us and um, it met with a similar fate. And then um, Charles Crow, uh, who lived in France, um, wanted to get in touch with the Martians using mirrors. And uh, so he, he got a bunch of mirrors to reflect light, or his idea was to reflect light from the sun to the Martians, and several mirrors, you know, in the shape of the Big Dipper, one where he lived. And I think you can guess what happened with that. Uh, the first funded project uh, was to send pornography into space. This was the <laughs> Pioneer 10 spacecraft. There was a big discussion about this. This is instructions of where we live in case they want to come and eat us in this path of the spacecraft leaving the Earth out of the solar system. And that was the first funded project. <laughs> then, um, so then there was kind of a theoretical approach. Uh, instead of uh, trying to get in touch with ET by making these messages, you could just calculate the number of civilizations uh, in our galaxy, the number of communicating civilizations in our galaxy. It's called the Drake Equation, named after Frank Drake. And, uh, and all you have to do is multiply all these numbers together. The problem with the Drake Equation is that we have no idea what any of these numbers are. <laughs> um, I'll give you a hint about how it works. Some of you may know about it. It's, it's kind of a whittling down process. You start with the number of stars in the galaxy, a couple hundred billion stars. And you say, well, how many of those stars have planets? How many planets are there? How many of those planets are good planets that have the right chemicals, the right environment, the right temperature? And once you have a good planet, do you get life? How, what fraction does life get started on? Uh, does life get uh, primitive life? And then does, what fraction does it evolve? Uh, and does it become intelligent life? And then these last factors are how, what fraction, once you get intelligence, what fraction actually has communication technology? Do they have radio or lasers or something that we can communicate with? And the last factor is, how long does a civilization live? Do they blow themselves up right away as soon as they develop nuclear weapons and radio and lasers? Or do they, you know, our stars at five billion years old, it's gonna last another three billion years. So you, you can have civilizations that last a long time if they can maybe get through that bottleneck of nuclear and other kinds of weapons, bioweapons. Uh, and some stars are 10 billion years old. So there may be very advanced civilizations out there quite ahead of us. This is uh, the break equation, which is a little different than the Drake equation. The number of civilizations um, uh, is um, four pi, why not anyway, <laughs> times u, a big unknown, somewhere between one and 100 billion, times the fraction of u that does SETI, uh, times some fraction of u that fulfills some important but unknown criterion, <laughs> and times b, a Boolean term, either one or zero. <laughs> um, so we don't really know how much life is out there, but we're optimistic, or at least I'm optimistic, the guy in black is pessimistic. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons I'm optimistic is because there are a few places in our solar system which actually have liquid water. You need, we think we need, you need liquid water. Maybe you can do it with ammonia or methane or something like that. But liquid water is uh, to make life as we know it. And there's a few places that have liquid water, maybe. Um, Mars had liquid water on it for a few, couple of billion years. And uh, a moon of Jupiter, Europa, 
we think has liquid water underneath some ice, about 50 miles of ice. There's probably an ocean underneath that ice. Maybe there's something swimming around down there. Um, Brian, you <laughs> yeah. want to talk about this guy? Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone recognize? I, I, I don't think many people would. This is a man named uh, Richard Hoagland, uh, a space scientist who's best known for being the proponent that this image is actually a face on Mars. And not only a face, but, um, but a message, uh, a construct from some ancient Martian civilization. But is it any coincidence that the face resembles no one so much as Dr. Richard Hoagland himself? <laughs> so, coincidence? I like the, oh, Dan, by the way, I did want to comment that you seem to have already categorized us as a good planet. The Earth is a good planet. Oh, yeah. sorry. Right. I, I like that, Mars. in greater good for life. Um, I think, yeah. Are we Mars? a good planet? The man in white says we are. <laughs> I think we're on a good planet. We'll see who gets elected on Tuesday. Uh, exactly. We could slip to the dark side. Uh, so we don't really know how life got started, but we think it got started in something like this, the primordial soup. Uh, and life did get started on Earth pretty early. The oldest rocks you can find have microfossils on them. So it didn't take long here on Earth. So some people are optimistic that because it happened quickly on Earth, that means it might happen quickly in other places. And people have done experiments. Uh, this is a famous experiment where they didn't actually make life, but they made the precursors to life. This was, they put in a flask, some of the early gases that were around at the beginning of the Earth, some methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen, and they made sparks that simulate lightning. And you don't get gorillas crawling out of this thing, but you do get amino acids, the building blocks of life. So we're beginning to understand how, how you can make life. Um, although we don't understand the details of how that happened. Um, so then the question is, well, how are we going to get in touch with these civilizations if they're out there? So one idea is that they may have radio or television or radar or navigational beacons, much like the way Earth does, that we could detect these, these radio signals coming off of their planet. And there are a lot of radio signals that come off our planet. Uh, and this is a plot of television signals or amount of television power leaving the Earth as a function of time, 1940, 1950, 1960. And you can see we're growing, we're getting very bright, we're brighter than the sun at television frequencies, and we're still growing exponentially, although we're not growing as fast as we used to be. So television signals have been leaving the Earth now for 50, 60 years. I Love Lucy's gone about past 10,000 stars. The nearby stars have seen The Simpsons. So then you can ask the question, well, so we're broadcasting out there, maybe ET's either sending a message unintentionally, the way we leak television and radar of our planet. We've even sent messages unintentionally. This is a, a message sent from the Arecibo dish that consisted of a sequence of zeros and ones. And when you rearrange them into black and white squares, you see a DNA molecule, a person, a solar system, a telescope, some binary numbers, some amino acids, stuff. Uh, and Dan, isn't that a big assumption that, it, that some alien civilization would even perceive a human there, or a, that, that, that that's Arecibo, I mean, uh, I, I, yeah. that's, a, that's a pretty big problem, the issue of communicating with uh, species that don't yeah, even They give this message planet. to humans and they can't even figure it exactly. out. Exactly, I mean, <laughs> I, I, can't read, I can't even read Hebrew and I'm Jewish. <laughs> There's a, uh, yeah, I don't know if they're figured it out. It was more of a message to Earthlings that said, uh, we're kind of getting the game here. We should think about what the consequences of contact are. It's kind of a wake-up message to get people thinking about this. Uh, in fact, it was in, it intentionally sent to something that's 100,000 years away. So it's not going to, you know, it went to a globular cluster. Oh, so it's not our problem. It's generations down the line. It's their problem. <laughs> you, know, you mentioned the, the consequences of it. Could you show that pioneer plaque again? You sort of touched on this, but that always looked to me... Like, uh, with all the information it has on it, it just looks like a menu with directions to the restaurant, completely. And we look so fleshy and delicious, we don't have an exoskeleton. They could have used at least a little artistic license and made us look more fearsome, maybe claws, maybe we look easier to eat than a pistachio or a crab. It was an extremely controversial message. In fact, they removed some lines on the woman. They used to have them holding hands, and they thought, oh, that would be complicated. They think we're one creature. Uh, and that was drawn by uh, Linda Sagan, uh, Carl's first wife. Um, so anyway, we're looking for these signals, either uh, an artifact like our radio or television, or maybe they send us a deliberate signal, which would be pretty spectacular. Uh, if they send us a deliberate signal, we think it'll probably be easy to decode with lots of pictures and language <coughs> lessons. Um, and we'll have a while to figure it out. And we might get on the, they might be way ahead of us and they might tell us how to get on the galactic internet and tell us about the thousands of other civilizations they've been talking to and 
sent us there, Library of Congress, music, poetry, literature, science, medicine, so we could learn a lot. So people have been doing this for a while now. The early radio pioneers from 100 years ago, Tesla and Marconi, both looked for radio signals and both thought that they had uh, found signals. There were big headlines in the paper. Um, Frank Drake, the guy who did the Drake Equation, did a search about 50 years ago. And now there are a number of different groups looking for these radio signals or laser signals. And uh, at Berkeley, we have uh, six different programs looking for different kinds of radio signals, pulse continuous signals. We have a couple of optical programs. Jeff Marcy did one looking for signals. Uh, our group did another one. We also have a thing in, in the infrared, uh, wavelengths between radio. One of our early projects was funded by NASA, and NASA requires that you use acronyms. So SERENIP is the search for extraterrestrial radio emissions from nearby developed intelligent populations. We use these big radio antennas, um, and this one is 300 feet across. And while we were using it, this is what happened. And, and you might ask, how did that happen? Oh, but, and according to the World Weekly News, the aliens did not want to be discovered. This happened while, while we were using the telescope, and they zapped it. Uh, and that zap theory may be correct. This is another telescope we use, and this is what happened to that telescope. Uh, so we're testing the zap theory of this telescope. This is the world's largest telescope. It hasn't been zapped by aliens yet. This is 1,000 feet across in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. You might have seen it in the James Bond Golden Eye movie or in Contact. Um, it, and it holds that bowl, that dish, holds 10 billion bowls of cornflakes. And we've got a way to use this telescope at the same time that the other astronomers are using it. So we're always scanning the skies, uh, looking for these signals. This is the original kind of signal we used to look for, just a, a narrow band signal at some frequency. Lots of different frequencies, and here's a strong signal. Then we started looking for drifting signals, that <whistles> or pulsing signals, bit, bit, bit. That's the new thing. Instead, he's looking for pulses, radio pulses. We store the data on a, on a big national uh, energy supercomputing center. We have um, a few petabytes of data. And we send it out to people. We used to build these big supercomputers. Now we send it out to volunteers around the world who help us analyze the data. Uh, it's called the SETI Home Program. If any of you want to participate, you can download a screensaver. You install it on your machine. First thing it does is it goes out and gets a piece of data. Everybody gets a different part of the sky to work on, different pieces of data. And, uh, and then you analyze that data looking for strong signals. Here it's found a Gaussian thing. It reminds you on the screen it comes up. It just comes up whenever you're not using your computer like any other screensaver, but it's actually doing something useful instead of just putting up pretty pictures of goldfish swimming around it's, or flying toasters. It's, actually looking for interesting signals from the part of the sky you've been allocated. It reminds you what your name is, how much work you've done, what part of the sky you're looking at. And then when it's done, after a few days, it'll put up a little message, send back the results of the analysis, any strong signals that it might have found. It sends them back to us at Berkeley, up at Space Science Labs. And then you get a new piece of, of work uh, from a different part of the sky. And you just keep doing that until you find ET. Um, you get the Nobel Prize. Your name is attached to that data. Uh, I, I'm actually not on the Nobel Committee, but if you do get the Nobel Prize, um, the problem is that you have to share it with a lot of people. There's five million people now who are helping us uh, analyzing the data spread out in 200 countries. Uh, and the Nobel Prize is, uh, I think, a million euros. So you get about uh, 20 cents or something. You, know, you won't get rich. Uh, and the people donate about 1,000 years of computing time every day. They donate a couple million years of computing time. It's the biggest supercomputer on the planet if you add up all the volunteers helping us search for ET. We still haven't found them. You can participate if you want by putting up a little picture of yourself. Or you can join a team. There are 60,000 teams. They compete with each other. Some people are pretty serious. They build these uh, big computer clusters in their basements. They all look kind of nerdy like this guy. Um, <laughs> these work units go on eBay. This guy auctions 7,000 work units to join the elite top uh, all SETI users. These people are addicted to SETI at home. The website's very popular, gets a couple million hits a day. We've developed some curriculum for kids. It's a good way to get kids interested in SETI. It hooks them into biology and evolution, astronomy, chemistry. Um, then we, we end up with a list of candidates. The most interesting candidates that we've found so far are things that we've seen multiple times on the sky, and each time we've seen roughly the same kind of signal at the same frequency. We have a list of a few thousand of these things that we keep going back and checking out, but so far, no signals from ET. That led to a generalized idea of using computers at home to do lots of supercomputing projects, not just SETI. And now you can participate in about 50 different projects. There's drug research for HIV um, and malaria and cancer. You can use your computer to do climate, climate modeling, global warming, a lot of astronomy projects. There's a, um, 
And this is climate prediction, this is gravity waves, this is protein folding. And you can allocate how you want your computer to be used. You can say 10% for SETI and 20% for cancer research. And the idea is there's a lot of computing power, and most of it's at home and business compared to what you can afford at your university. We're also doing an optical SETI search, and Jeff did an optical SETI search. Uh, this is the one at Lick. We have one at Leuschner looking for laser signals. This is the one that, that Jeff did at Keck. He also did one at Lick. Um, we were also doing this infrared search. And um, we also got a, this new project that we're doing with the SETI Institute, building a whole new kind of radical, different kind of telescope. Instead of building one giant dish, uh, you make it out of lots and lots of little dishes. These are dinky dishes. They're 20 feet across. You can stamp them out like hot tubs. They're quite cheap. In fact, if you want to buy one, put your name on it, or write me a check afterwards, come talk to me. Um, and anyway, it's called the Allen Telescope Array, named after Paul Allen. It's in Northern California. Paul Allen co-founded Microsoft with, with Bill Gates, who's got a lot of money and helped us out. Uh, and and uh, this is, it's got these wideband feeds. This is what we hope it'll look like eventually, hundreds and hundreds of dishes. Um, and uh, we put them all together to make one giant telescope. Uh, this is uh, maybe what it'll look like. This is what it looks like now. We have 42 dishes, and we're trying to raise more money to build it out. Um, and it's a nice way to make a telescope. It's actually cheaper. These little telescopes all connected together. You can look at a big chunk of the sky. We have one experiment where we're pointing all the telescopes at different places. So we can look at a huge chunk of the sky, 200 square degrees all at once, looking for these radio pulses. Uh, that might lead to a giant telescope called the Square Kilometer Array uh, that is a big international project. So this is kind of a summary of our data. 30 trillion fruitless tries, but scientists keep searching for ET. Actually, now we're up to a million trillion fruitless tries. We haven't found them. But I'm an optimist, unlike my colleague Jeff, uh, the pessimist in black. The reason I'm an optimist is because I think we're just scratching the surface. So even though I've been looking for 30 years, I haven't found anything, um, and uh, I'm actually optimistic in the long run. I think Earthlings are just getting in the game. We're just learning how to do this. If you look at the searches that we've done, even though I'm incredibly proud of the searches that we've done, my colleagues have done, they've just, just really looked at a, a little bit of the search space that's out there. This is kind of all the frequencies that you could look at in the radio spectrum, what part of the sky these searches have done, how sensitive they are. And there's some searches that we've done and our colleagues have done. And notice that, um, that if they're maybe in, at these frequencies, maybe if we're lucky, we could find them. But if they're at these frequencies, nobody's searched out here. Um, and, but I'm, I'm optimistic in the long run um, because uh, this technology or the, the search is kind of limited by computing power. It's limited, uh, and that's a good kind of limit to have. That's, uh, if you look at our capabilities, we used to have 100 channels, then we had 60,000, then 4 million. Now we have a few billion channels. The capabilities are doubling every year. So I think we have a long way to go before we have a good chance of finding signals if they're out there. Dan, I see that you search on a lot of different frequencies. How specific is a search specific to a star? Is it how narrow is it that way? I mean, and, and are you only searching for signals within our galaxy? So some people do what's called a targeted search, where they usually pick nearby stars that are kind of like our sun, older stars, and uh, maybe stars that Jeff has found. They have planets going around, and and they target those searches, those stars. And then they can look very carefully because they spend a long time at each star. What our group is really better at is doing big sky surveys. We just raster scan the sky back and forth, looking at every star in our galaxy, or almost every star in our galaxy, and also all other galaxies as well. Is there uh, a thought that, uh, but we that can't an spend artificial much time. signal could be detected from another galaxy? Yeah, so it, we don't really know what the first civilization will be. Will it be a nearby star, or will it be some distant thing that's much more powerful? And if you look out at night, you look at this, the bright stars, you think, oh, they must be nearby. But actually, the brightest stars you see are pretty far away um, because there, there are some stars that are incredibly bright, much brighter than our sun. And so actually, the, most, the brightest stars you see are ones that are far away. That may be the case with extraterrestrials as well, that, that, the, that the first time we, we find another civilization, it may be one that's incredibly advanced with very powerful transmitters that are very far away, perhaps in a distant galaxy. Maybe we they're using stars as yeah. the communication device. That's, a, that's an interesting idea, that, that advanced civilizations may be able to harness the gas around them to maze or amplify or something like that. They can blink their star, put in chemicals or something that, that make it turn on and off. And, uh, and they can maybe send much more powerful messages than, than what we do with our radio.
I wanted to warn you that SETI can be dangerous. If you're thinking about joining our research group or participating in SETI at home, this guy, when he talked about life on other worlds, he was burned at the stake. Um, I, uh, now people who are participating in SETI at home, some people just, instead of just loaning us their computers, they want to participate in other ways. They send us poetry, they send us uh, music, and you can, uh, literature, there's a lot of stuff on the website that people send. Uh, some people help us write the code, it's all open source. Um, the, and some people send us haikus, and there are several thousand haikus on the website that people have sent us. Uh, I'm just going to read you two of them. Paula Cook at Duke University, searching for lives, searching for life, answers are revealed about ourselves. And Dan Seidner, one million earthlings bounded by optimism leave their PCs on. <laughs> uh, so now I want to turn it over to the guy in black, uh, Jeff Marcy, who's going to tell you why I'm wasting my time. And then we're going to interact a little bit, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. I've always been fascinated by, in, a, in the, the breadth of your knowledge. These astronomers, I know that Dan is also a computer scientist and has a very, oh, he mentioned Paul Allen and Bill Gates. Dan was part of the homebrew computing group, which was here in the Bay Area, which consisted of Steve Jobs, uh, Steve Wozniak, um, Dan, and occasionally Bill Gates would stop by, and, and, and Dan likes to point out that he's the only one that is not fabulously wealthy, because uh, was Ron Hipschman uh, around also? So these guys that are, that are astronomers, they also have, uh, and the kind of work they're doing requires uh, a lot of math and data crunching, and even being able to figure out whether you could crunch this sort of data for SETI. I remember you said you, there was some skepticism that, this for, that computers could do Fourier analysis. Um, a couple decades ago. And so the computers could even be used for this kind of stuff didn't even seem possible a couple decades ago, three decades ago, maybe. So very much, uh, very good. Dan Worth ever. Now, uh, dressed in black, the pessimist who has discovered 150, him and his team have discovered over 150 planets circling other stars. Please welcome Jeff Marcy. to be here uh, is quite a privilege, uh, and it's going to be a tough act to follow, that's for sure. Um, I'm going to tell you some good news about uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and then I'm going to try to tell you the truth. Uh, and uh, so I'll start with a reminder. We do all of our work, including the work that Dan has been describing, within our Milky Way galaxy. It's an enormous collection of 200 billion stars, 100,000 light years across. Uh, and of course, our sun resides in the suburbs of the Milky Way galaxy. What I find spectacular about our Milky Way is that we now know that the laws of physics and chemistry and math that we all learn in school apply equally well from one side of the Milky Way to the other. Laws of gravity, electromagnetism, quantum mechanics, the same, even the constants of nature are the same within our Milky Way. And that should give us some confidence that the physical properties that we see here on the Earth and within our solar system, the chemistry here on the Earth, should be reproduced elsewhere in the Milky Way galaxy. Why not? The laws are all the same, giving us the suggestion that Earth-like planets uh, that we see, well, our own Earth right here, might be reproduced elsewhere in the Milky Way galaxy. What we don't know, however, is whether or not there are universal laws of biology, analogous to the physical and chemistry laws. The turning down the lights a little bit would be awfully nice, just a bit. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so one of the questions you might ask about biology, are there universal laws of biology? What uh, attributes of biology that we see here on the Earth might, in fact, be reproduced elsewhere with life forms and other places in the universe? For example, is it true that life always depends on the presence of water in liquid form, as it apparently does here on the Earth. Also, you might ask whether there are other replicating molecules, organics, that can code from one generation to the next, the structure of life allowing life to evolve. Is DNA the only molecule that can do the job? 
And I think the most profound biology law, for which we don't know the, the definitive answer, is whether or not Darwinian evolution leads inexorably toward intelligent critters, as we humans think of ourselves, or whether instead intelligence represents some sort of quirk or twig on the evolutionary tree. So these are fundamental biology questions for which not knowing the answer makes it difficult to predict whether life will be common elsewhere in the universe, and in particular, intelligent life. And of course, our ignorance stems from the fact that we still, to this day, in 2008, have only one example of life else, anywhere in the universe, and that's right here on the Earth. With just one or two other examples, we'd be able to generalize, but we can't do that at the present time. And so we're beginning to look for life elsewhere in the universe, starting, of course, with our solar system. And as Dan Wertheimer mentioned, we're already looking on Mars, on some of the giant moons of the giant planets. And so we're beginning to hunt for life in our solar system, but certainly there's no intelligent life there. And as a result, we're going to look elsewhere, as Dan has been doing with his SETI search. We have to move out into the Milky Way galaxy, the 200 billion stars there, to have hope of detecting uh, intelligent species, uh, and maybe even the first uh, primitive life. Now, we've been doing this here at UC Berkeley with baby steps. We are starting by hunting for planets and edging ever closer toward finding Earth-like planets. And the way we do it is by watching the host star to see if it wobbles due to the gravitational pull on the star by an orbiting planet. And this has been a successful technique. We actually watch the star's light to see if the Doppler shift varies. And you remember the Doppler shift as a star moves toward the Earth or away from the Earth, the frequencies of the light waves, analogous to sound waves, shift back and forth as the star approaches and recedes. And so what we do at Berkeley is we watch the light from a star at the back end of a telescope with a fancy spectrometer to see if the rainbow of colors shifts back and forth. And we're lucky here at Berkeley to have access to the world's largest telescope, the Keck Telescope, which is, uh, you probably all know, is located on the big island of Hawaii, high atop a uh, hopefully dormant volcano called Mauna Kea. And that's where we hunt for planets uh, monthly. In fact, we have a remote observing station that we use right here on campus, and we run the telescope on the top of Mauna Kea from Campbell Hall, right, right across the way here. Uh, the precious jewel of the Keck telescope is not just the telescope, but the spectrometer. Uh, it's located at the back of the telescope where you would normally put an eyepiece. We remove the eyepiece and instead put this collection of about $10 million worth of optics. And the light comes in from the telescope. It hits a series of mirrors and diffraction gratings and prisms, spreading that white light from a nearby star into all of its composite colors blue, green, yellow, and red, which we detect with a digital camera, CCD detector, at the back. And here's what it looks like when you're at the telescope in Hawaii or observing with it from here on campus at Berkeley. We see the full rainbow of colors from a star broken apart. Uh, you even see these dark spectral lines. These are the two sodium D lines, for example, due to absorption by atoms in the star's atmosphere. And what happens is, as the star wobbles around, yanked by any planets that might be orbiting it, we see the spectrum shift. And it looks something like this. You watch the spectrum carefully, and it actually shifts from one month to the next. Come back a month later, maybe you see it shift again. As the planet orbits the star, it yanks the star now back in the other direction. And so we actually detect this uh, periodicity in the Doppler shift of the starlight, thereby allowing us to infer the presence of a planet and even measure its mass. Now, the problem is that I've overly exaggerated the effect. The actual amount of shift is only one one thousandth of one pixel on the uh, digital camera detector, the CCD. So detecting one one thousandth of a pixel is hard. We do it with software that we've written. We magnify one spectral line. And here's one of these dark spectral lines magnified. And over the course of weeks or months or years, we see that spectral line shift. And you can see how we detect as tiny as a thousandth of a pixel displacement of the line. It's the amount of light 
in the neighboring pixels that ever so slightly varies as the spectral, dark spectral line blocks off fractions of one pixel or its neighbor. And so by measuring the amount of light, as a digital camera always does, in the individual pixels, we can detect these fractional, tiny uh, Doppler shifts of the light. So that's the way we find planets. And we've been pretty lucky. We found, well, as, uh, as you heard, over 150. Here's one of the, uh, my favorites. You're seeing a graph here of the Doppler shift of the light, the amount of Doppler shift, uh, which we uh, translate into the actual motion of the star, the velocity of the star, over the course of time. And you see here, what do we have, 1999, 2000, 2001 up to 2005. You can see the velocity of the star vary as measured by these data points. Each point represents a visit to the Mauna Kea telescope, uh, and uh, we then record the Doppler shift. And you can connect the dots, as we do using a Newtonian uh, model of physics of a planet orbiting a star. And you can see that the solid line, which is our predicted velocities from this model, computer model of a planet orbiting a star, goes very nicely through the data points, the dots. Uh, and if you look carefully, sure enough, you see a periodicity in the velocity of the star with about a two-thirds of a year period from one peak to the next. But interestingly, superimposed on that two-thirds of a year periodicity, the velocities rise and then fall and then rise again. And that, of course, indicates there's a second planet taking even longer to go around the star, yanking on it, taking several years. And so we can decompose those velocity measurements, those two periodicities, into the separate planets that the sum of which gives you the data we actually see. So there really are two planets orbiting this star that we've detected. Uh, two thirds of a year is the period of the inner planet. The outer pl planet has a period of three or four years. These happen to be a couple of Jupiter masses. We can infer from the amount of wobble. The more the star is yanked by the planet, the more massive the planet must be to yank on the star with, with the resulting velocity variation that we measure. So by making these Doppler shift measurements, building a computer model using Newton's laws of physics, we can infer the properties of the planets in addition to their existence. So this is pretty nice, a, a, a double planet uh, system. Here's another one that's even more exciting. We just announced this last year. Here you see again the velocity we measure over the course of time, going back to 1988 when we started this. And you're seeing now almost 20 years of data that we've been doing this game. And you see the dots represent the velocity measurements. It looks pretty ugly, pretty nasty. But if you look carefully, you see the velocities go up. And then around 1996, they started dropping. And then around 2002, the velocities started rising. But what's all this variation in the Doppler shift measurements? Well, it turns out that we can use a technique called Fourier analysis, which simply means we're hunting for the uh, periodicities. I'll go back a slide. We're hunting for periodicities that are buried, hidden in the data because of the complexity of it. And so when we do that, what we see is when applying the Fourier analysis, we see that as a function of the prospective orbital periods of the planets, a whopping period emerges right here at 14.6 days. So there's a second planet in addition to this long period planet that your human eye picked out right away, taking over a decade, 14 years. There's a second inner planet buzzing around the star while there's this outer one. And of course, that allows us to build a computer model of a star with two planets. Predict the velocities, therefore, that the star should have due to those two planets. And then we can subtract the predicted velocities from the velocities that we observed to see if they agree. We've done that, subtracted them, and then, of course, we can use a Fourier analysis to look for periodicities in those differences in velocities, the, the discrepancy between the observed and predicted velocities. And indeed, it turns out that the differences of those two show yet a third periodicity with a period of 44 days. In other words, buried in the data, was yet a third wobble of the star uh, with a planet that has a period of about one and a half months. We play the same game, build a 
computer model of a star now with three planets, predict the velocities, subtract them from the observed velocities, and indeed we find a fourth planet orbiting that star with a period of 2.8 days, and a hint of a fifth when we build the model with four planets, subtract that, indeed the fifth planet stands out like a proverbial sore thumb. So this is a star, 55 Cancri is the name of it, it's a sunlight star that has five full planets orbiting it. Quite uh, a remarkable uh, system, family of planets. Here's a sketch. Um, you see 55 Cancri in the center. There's one, two, three, four planets. And then the fifth one out here is about four times the mass of Jupiter. And for comparison, here's our own solar system. The Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and even Saturn. And what I think is rather uh, cute, if not uh, scientifically interesting, is that architecturally, structurally, the, uh, our solar system and the 55 Cancri solar system have some similarities. We both have a big planet, this one, four Jupiter masses, in our case, one Jupiter mass. And then there's a gap, you see, between the fourth and the fifth planet in both cases. Why there's a gap in either case, we're not entirely sure. In the case of our solar system, maybe Jupiter played a role with its huge gravity clearing this gap. It doesn't explain the whole gap. And in this system, we're not sure either. So it's rather interesting. We're beginning to find other planetary systems that remind us of our own. And I think that's very good news for SETI. Clearly, there are other planets out there and full systems of planets that have the same physical properties as our own solar system. By the way, here's an artist sketch by Lynette Cook of 55 Cancri, uh, a star very much like our sun with the five planets. You see them uh, magnified down below, the 55 Cancri, the inner, second one, third one, fourth one, and then here's the fifth giant Jupiter out here. So a system uh, quite a bit like our own. And interestingly, we found quite a few multi-planet systems. We now have about 32 of them. Uh, this graphic I made up a couple weeks ago, and we're just about to announce four more multi-planet systems that are not represented here. Um, but you see the host star on the left, and then the green dot represents where the planet is in distance from its host star. So we have a lot of families of planets now that tell us that, yes, indeed, our own solar system almost certainly is not a rarity. Probably the Earth is not a rarity either. And the best hint that our Earth is not a rarity comes from these data. This is a nearby star, uh, only about uh, 15 light years away. And this is velocity over the course of time. But now you're only seeing about five days of data. And you see the velocities go up and down and up and down. Yes, it looks noisy for a good reason. This planet has a mass that's only about seven and a half times that of our Earth. And you can see that we can just barely detect it. So we now have the technology, just barely able to detect planets that have the smell of the Earth, albeit a little bit too large. So we're getting close. And that leads uh, to the last part of my presentation, which is, OK, we've found planets. We've found systems of planets. What about Earth-like planets and the prospect of finding habitable planets, planets that might not just be habitable, but inhabited? And so that leads to the question, are there Earth-like planets out there, and what can we say about them? Well, I think a fair amount at this stage. We'd like to find other Earths. We don't quite have the technology to do it. I'm going to tell you in a few minutes how we're going to find other Earths. But it's not just rocky planets we need. We need planets that have lukewarm temperatures. So there might be water in liquid form, the uh, primary prerequisite for life. And so that means you need a rocky planet that's not too close to its host star, which would uh, render that planet too hot, scorched by the proximity to its star. You don't want your Earth to be too far away, because then it receives too little light from the star, rendering it too cold, much like the frigid, arid uh, surface of Mars. Instead, we'd like our uh, rocky planets, in order to be habitable, to be, as Goldilocks would say it, just the right distance. Uh, so that the water could be lukewarm and hence not frozen, not steam, but water that tr is truly liquid to serve as the solvent for biochemistry. So the search for habitable worlds means you need to look for rocky planets and indeed those that are at the right distance.
from that host star. And we're beginning to do that. We're also trying to figure out what other properties of rocky planets are required for them to be truly habitable. What are the conditions needed for a planet to be life-bearing? And interestingly, the best information we get about habitability comes from looking at the least hospitable places on the planet Earth. And remarkably, one of the least hospitable places on the Earth is our beloved national park, Yellowstone. Uh, you go to Yellowstone, immediately, of course, you see the boiling water coming out of the geysers and the hot springs that characterize Yellowstone. In the winter, like right now, uh, snow hits 10 feet, 20 feet of snow. You couldn't have more contrast between boiling water and 20 feet of snow that uh, befalls Yellowstone. And on top of that hideous sort of variation, the water in Yellowstone is heavily acidic. And you can go and test this yourself. You can be a little uh, Yellowstone biochemist. You can bring pH paper, go to one of the hot springs, and you can indeed see this one, Churning Cauldron, is quite hot. And uh, my wife and I did this. We uh, took some pH paper, connected it to a black clip, and then tied the black clip to a string. And here's what it looked like when we pulled it out of the hot spring. There's the pH paper, pH of two. The black clip is no longer black uh, because of the water. Uh, because of the acidity of the water, pH of two, of course, is sort of nearly battery acid acidity. And then as if to laugh in our human faces, uh, you look at the string and there was algae drawn up on it. Uh, there are bacteria of a wide variety of species as well as algae. Uh, living not just happily in that boiling acidic water, but frankly they die at room temperature. So it's a remarkable example that life can not only thrive but evolve nicely to fill whatever niche uh, the uh, Milky Way's Earth-like planets might throw at it. So that's a good sign again for life. Certainly at the bacterial level, at the microbial level, uh, life can thrive no matter the chemistry, the temperature, the amount of sunlight, and so on. Life, we now know, thrives beautifully in the most hideous environments on the Earth, and, health, and hence, elsewhere in the universe, they would thrive as well. So that leads to a question. The suggestion now is that if you try to ask the question, is anybody out there, you have to break that question up into two pieces. Surely, the petri dishes for life are common. We know that the chemicals of which organic molecules are composed are common in the universe, including amino acids that we see directly uh, in the clouds between the stars. We also know that the solvent for biochemistry, water, is a very common molecule in the galaxy. We see it on comets, certainly common on other planets. And we know there's plenty of energy tidal energy, geothermal energy, and of course the sunlight or starlight from other stars. So all the, uh, the ingredients for the recipe of life are abundant in the universe, and that tells you immediately, as the molecular biologists uh, confirm, that primitive life, uh, single-celled uh, microbial life, must be, as far as we can tell, common in the universe, as long as life can in fact get kick-started which does remain an open question. How do you start life? But if you can, it seems to me that all of the ingredients are there. And that leads to the one final question that, uh, leads, that is related to the color that I'm wearing here. And that is, well, fine. We've got planets. We've got microbes. What about intelligent critters? And here the story is, oh, I, in my opinion, a little more bleak uh, as, a, as the pessimistic point of view. Yes, we probably have 30 billion planetary systems, at least, within our Milky Way, based on our estimates so far. Many of them have been around for millions and indeed billions of years. And that leads to the question, what fraction of these 30 billion planetary systems uh, evolve intelligent life? Well, the most pessimistic answer I've ever heard uh, is that maybe intelligent life is a one in a million shot. You start with billions of habitable planets, but only one in a million of them forms intelligent life. And if true, you multiply one in a million by 30 billion, and you still end up not just with thousands of advanced intelligent civilizations, but they are indeed maybe hundreds of millions of years technologically more advanced than we are. 
They should be out there, and there should be thousands of them just within our Milky Way galaxy alone, never mind the hundreds of billions of galaxies that are also out there beyond our Milky Way. And so the science fiction writers had it right, apparently, uh, that the galaxy is so filled with advanced civilizations that the Romulans and the Klingons practically ran into each other uh, at night while they uh, were buzzing around the galaxy. And there's great galactic country clubs out there and great warfare and so on. That's the prediction from science fiction. It's the prediction that we ourselves came up with by multiplying one in a million times billions of planetary systems. But there's something not quite right, in my view, about this prediction. And what's apparently not quite right is if the Milky Way galaxy is teeming with intelligent life, well, why haven't we seen them yet? The moon has been sitting there for four and a half billion years as a quiescent, erosion-free environment. We don't see the obelisk depicted in 2001. We don't see crash debris from other civilizations that came and looked at the moon. We don't see cameras left on the moon taking pictures of the Earth left there by other aliens to watch the evolution of life on the Earth. There are footprints on the moon, but they're ours, nobody else's. So that's rather remarkable. Four and a half billion years and no one came to visit the moon. Mars, same story. If our Milky Way galaxy is teeming with intelligent life, why, are there no, why is there no evidence of past visitors, spacecraft, uh, equipment, instruments that they would have left seismometers and so on, cameras? The Earth is probably the best um, alien detector we've got. This is a Shangri-La of a planet, right? The Earth has liquid water, it's had rainforests for uh, a couple billion years, beautiful beachfront property. No alien with their advanced telescopes that Dan Wertheimer was mentioning can image us, noticed how beautiful our Earth was, and came and put up a resort hotel, a golf course, a tennis court, or so on. No one uh, with this galaxy supposedly teeming with advanced life no one has visited us. I find that rather amazing. Um, moreover, we have hundreds of professional telescopes worldwide watching the night sky every night for everything from UFOs, if they were to appear, to uh, you know, gamma ray bursts from their matter-antimatter engines. And in fact, we don't see either the UFOs with any kind of clarity that you'd want to bank, you know, bet your house on, nor the gamma ray bursts, and so on. So there's a growing concern that without any of the evidence that you would expect from a galaxy teeming with advanced life, maybe they're not as common as we might have thought from watching science fiction. Of course, the SETI difficulties uh, add to this. So where are they? Well, one thing is that's possible is we've made a mistake. Maybe the galaxy is not teeming with advanced life. There's advanced life out there, I have no doubt. But maybe you have to go a thousand light years or a million light years to find the nearest neighbor. Maybe our hypothesis is flawed and the intelligent life is not as common as we had thought. And there's three reasons why that might be. I'll just quickly go through why it might be that intelligent life might be more rare than we had been thinking. One is that our Earth might be more precious as a habitable planet than we had thought. Maybe Earth-like planets acquire water, the, ne the necessity uh, of life, but it's rare to have an Earth-like planet that has some water, but some continents as well. Maybe most rocky planets are either dry or covered by water, and it's rare to have just the right amount of liquid water to give you some, but not a full water world, in which case uh, technological life would be impossible. Electronic engineers, electrical engineers, certainly need dry land to do their work. Another reason that intelligent life might be rare is that maybe evolution doesn't naturally lead to intelligence. After all, the dinosaurs roamed the Earth, get this, for 200 million years, the reptiles roamed the Earth. In all of that time, with all of the dinosaur evolution, evolution did not lead to chess players or, or uh, concerto writers or indeed rocket builders. Their brains didn't uh, grow, and of course, we think we know why, the, molecular, the uh, evolutionary biologists are telling us that intelligence doesn't actually make you fitter, more able to survive against 
the other critters out there. So maybe our big brains uh, are a bit of a rarity. Maybe evolution doesn't favor intelligence that much. If it did, flies would be getting more intelligent. Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe cats would learn to play the violin or the piano. Uh, but you know that the cats for, for you know, 50 million years uh, are, not, are not becoming much smarter. Certainly the, the, cats that, uh, the two cats I have in my house are not getting any smarter. Uh, so there's one last reason that intelligent life might be rare. Maybe we don't live long enough as a technological civilization. We expected a thousand technological civilizations but they better last long enough to overlap the next technological civilization and the next one and the next one. And maybe technological civilizations simply, uh, for whatever reason, uh, nuclear weapons, biological weapons, chemical weapons, some sort of social unrest, have trouble surviving long enough so that the Milky Way galaxy would in fact be populated by many of them. Maybe their lifetimes are simply too short. Remember, we humans have been technological, as Dan was just saying, We've only had radio technology for about 80 years. Never mind you know, uh, the several thousand years that we need, or maybe a million years that we need to overlap the next uh, civilization that comes along in the Milky Way galaxy. So I'll just finish by saying, yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, I know. Like, like continue to bring up your points, but maybe we can get Dan up here to respond. I think that, could I say one last thing, and I'll just, I'm really right at the end. I just want to tell you the exciting news. The Kepler mission is coming up next year. It's going to be the first mission to hunt for Earths. And what it's going to do is look for stars that are blocked in their starlight by Earths that orbit that host star. And the Kepler mission will launch in March allowing us to look for stars that dim by Earth-like planets, giving us the best chance to find those Earths. And then when we do find them in the Cygnus constellation, obviously, as Dan said, and I completely agree with him, the next thing you do is use the powerful radio telescopes that we have to search for life on those Earth-like planets. So yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> Marcy. Jeff Marcy, and let's bring back Dan Wertheimer. And uh, right off the bat, uh, Dan, do you have any responses to, to the numerous arguments that Jeff just gave us? Well, I, indeed I do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should sit down in that case. Uh, uh, stay up here? Okay. Okay. You need to access that? I want to access that. Good. Uh, so, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that Jeff was talking about. Um, I think. Um, you know, Jeff said that we, you know, we haven't found them, and that might be an indication that, uh, that there's no life out there. there. I think we're just beginning to do this search, and there could be radio signals going right through this room, and we wouldn't know about them. Um, and um, there, there was a lot of dogma in the beginning about what kind of signals we should look for. People thought we knew what, what wavelength to look for, what frequency. We knew what, where to point the telescope. Uh, we knew what kind of signal it would be. Now we're starting to branch out, um, think about different kinds of stars to look at and different kinds of signals and pulses and look at galaxies. But we still may not know what to do. But traditionally, we, we, there's been a kind of um, changing history of our, our, the fashion in SETI is changing. And so we might be looking for the wrong thing. Uh, and um, it, it may not be even electromagnetic waves. Right now, we think the best bet is, um, is electromagnetic signals, radio or laser or something. There may be something much better than that. There could be uh, things that travel faster than light, tachyons, or if you watch Star Trek, you know about subspace communication. Uh, and, uh, and there may be a whole network of stuff that we just don't know anything about. I still think it's worth looking. If you told Christopher Columbus 500 years ago, don't bother, go sailing for India, just wait 500 years and you'll get, have airplanes, it'll make your job much easier. <laughs> um, you know, I, so I think we, we have a chance, like he, he, you know, he, he discovered India or something like that, and, um, and we might be able to find something with our present technology, even though there may be some, something that's even better. But we know electromagnetic is work, you can communicate across the galaxy, even other galaxies with the technology that we have. The, Jeff talked about something called the Fermi paradox, which is a, Enrico Fermi, said, you know, if there are these advanced civilizations, why aren't they just flying around? Why aren't we talking to them already? Where is everybody? Uh, 
And the idea was that some stars are 10 billion years old, so there could be very advanced civilizations, uh, and we should have seen them already. And there are some books about this uh, I can recommend to you. Uh, one of my favorites is, if the universe is teeming with aliens, where is everybody? 50 solutions to the Fermi paradox. Um, and so one idea of, is that maybe the universe is teeming with life, but space travel is hard, and it takes a lot of energy. Certainly, we don't know how to go out to the stars. Maybe there's something that makes it difficult to go out to the stars in a rocket ship. The kind of counter argument is that you can go slowly. You don't have to go traveling near the speed of light. You can maybe scoop up fuel on the way or use laser sails or something like that. Um, and so we don't know if, if you can travel around in space like they, they do in Star Trek. Another possibility is the universe is teeming with life, but they're not really interested in zooming around the universe. They're poets. Um, they're not explorers. They've gone through this e evolutionary exponential phase, and they, they like to stay at home. And, they may, uh, and the counter argument is maybe some of them are poets, but what if one, one of them wants to go out and spread their uh, seed around the, around the universe? All it takes is one civilization to build a self-replicating probe, uh, and pretty soon probes will be all over the galaxy in a few million years. Another possibility that Jeff talked about is uh, that maybe they destroy themselves. Maybe they, you know, as soon as they uh, invent lasers and radio and they can communicate with each other, they also invent um, biotechnology and they make uh, uh, an airborne HIV virus or something and, and wipe out all life. Uh, but probably some of them might destroy themselves, but not all. And even if you wipe out advanced life on Earth, you know, with nuclear weapons, that would just wipe out advanced life on Earth. And it wouldn't take very long, I think, if you wipe out um, high-level high mammals. It wouldn't take very long on this, uh, it didn't take very long on, on Earth to get from kind of uh, low-level creatures, the dinosaurs, to us. So if you wipe out life, you don't have to, it doesn't set you back five billion years. It might take a few million years to get back. So, and eventually, you might get through that bottleneck where you elect the right president and you um, learn to get, live together and, and don't blow yourself up. So some civilizations are going to get through that bottleneck. Um, and, uh, and the other, the other idea is, is this idea of the prime directive. Maybe they're out there and they're watching us, um, but, um, but they decided they're not going to get in touch with us. We're primitive. We're still killing each other. Uh, and they're going to wait until we've you know, got a few thousand years of, of uh, not killing each other. And maybe then they'll get in touch with each other with us. Um, and, uh, and you might say, well, maybe they all, maybe some of them do that, but not all. And, and, but maybe they're interstellar police. So if you go and kind of want to launch an interstellar probe that pollutes, self-replicating probe that pollutes the universe, uh, the police will stop you. And you can't, you can't just come on, pollute your galaxy with all kinds of bad stuff. Um, so and we don't really know. It's, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. I'm actually, I, I agree with Jeff that I'm optimistic about primitive life. I think the big question is about intelligent life and whether life always evolves to become intelligent or some of the time, and Jeff was throwing out numbers like one in a million, one in a billion. We have no idea how often that happens. We just have that one example. Um, so there could be a lot of primitive life. I wouldn't, be discover I wouldn't even be surprised if there was primitive life on Mars in the early days when there was water on, on Mars, or maybe there were primitive life on Europa, or certainly in other solar systems. But I think that this big question that Jeff addressed is whether it evolves to intelligence. I think um, there's, there are lots of different evolutionary niches. And sometimes intelligence is not important to survive. It's better to have strength, or it's better to be fast, or maybe camouflage is a good thing. Uh, but in some cases, in some evolutionary niches, um, it's going to be good to be smart. And so if you have a planet with a, a wide variety of environments, then in some places, intelligence is going to be advantageous. And, and then evolution will get intelligence. And I think right now, if you wiped out humans uh, and you kind of set life back to chimpanzees or monkeys or something like that, pretty soon you get humans again, because intelligence is good in some places on Earth. Um, so I think maybe we should stop there and maybe go back and forth a little bit. Yeah, um, can we get both of you guys up here and then we'll open the door to, to some questions. Maybe you can come on out here in the, in the light. Uh, one thing that I'd like to respond to what, Dan, what you just said, one great way that intelligence might be important is that if it's essential to get off the earth, then 
it seems like intelligence is going to be a key to that. If it's important for us to spread to other ecosystems beyond the Earth, even Stephen Hawking, although this might not be his area of specialty, in recent years has been a big proponent of space colonization because we shouldn't have all our eggs, and I do mean that literally, ladies, all our eggs in one basket uh, because anything could happen, nuclear, genetic, uh, global warming. So... What do you think about that, Jeff? That uh, maybe that would, in hindsight, you know, that's the only way we can almost look at evolutionary things is that evolution, if we were looking back, was the key to us spreading on other worlds. Well, you know, I, I'd say two things. One is, if intelligent life is in fact rare, if our Milky Way galaxy has only two or half a dozen intelligent civilizations, it certainly makes our species all the more precious. We, we always thought of ourselves as special, but maybe we're not just uh, at the pinnacle of the Darwinian evolutionary tree here on Earth, but maybe we're rather special galactically. Uh, and so that means that we humans obviously should take care of ourselves. We should think of ourselves as a village. Um, and it does add to this notion, as you mentioned, that Stephen Hawking has promoted recently, that maybe the way to enhance our survival as a precious species is to diversify, not just geographically, as we've done on the Earth, but diversify uh, galactically. Uh, the problem with that, and I agree with the idea, we should try desperately to get a colony on Mars, maybe on uh, some of the moons of Jupiter, and so on. The problem is, is that traveling among the stars, as far as we can tell, is much more difficult than is depicted normally in science fiction. The amount of energy it takes, never mind time, to just travel a few light years might be prohibitive, and Dan alluded to this earlier, that it might just be that space travel is harder than we think. And if that's true, unfortunately, we won't even be able to carry out Stephen Hawking's wish. Right. And even, so even there might be many instances of technological civilization, but if the best they could do is send out light sails or multi-generational spaceships that might, not, that might not be enough impetus to really explore very far, except robotically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe we should uh, open the floor to some questions. We actually have some microphones, uh, one up there and one down here. Does anyone have any questions? Quite a few people do. Sir? I tried running SETI uh, for a while, and I was surprised that my cooling fan sped up when I ran SETI. <laughs> and I discovered that it was taking about 100 watts more than it does when it's idling. Um, and so if we have 5 million people doing that, that's 500 million watts of power uh, being used to calculate SETI. Last night we were admonished to turn off lights when we weren't using them and to conserve power. And I appreciate your comments on the cost effectiveness of SETI from the point of view of power and uh, the effect on global warming. Yeah. <laughs> and the demise of the species as a result of SETI. <laughs> uh, yeah, so actually, um, I won't get into details, but there's a big, on our, on our website, you probably know, there's a whole page about being green and how to keep your computer. And we don't recommend, we used to have people kind of leaving their computers on overnight just to do SETI at home, and we don't recommend that. It's fine to run it when you're using your computer anyway, when you're doing your word processing, you're reading your email. I don't think it takes extra energy, but we don't recommend leaving your computer on for the very reasons that, that you, you were talking about. Um, we don't want to heat up the planet too much. We've got other problems to worry about. But if you were just going to use it to play World of Warcraft anyway, <laughs> why not run SETI at home? Um, yeah, uh, it's actually a two-part question. First is, um, how much or of an effect is the fact that the sun has been stable for so long have? And certainly planets, Mars had water, then it didn't. Um, the Earth has been very blessed like that, that it's been possible to keep life going on the Earth for billions of years. And I'm wondering if, there's, if that's one of the things in the equation that says, well, everything's perfect except the sun fluctuates and so life becomes impossible because it really needs that to, to start up. Um, the second part is, um, it's the optimism. Um, if, if when you started 30, 30 years ago, if, if, if someone said a million trillion tries won't find them, um, you know, how, how long do, do, do you stay optimistic? And those are my two questions. So I'll take the first half and Dan will take the second half. Um, you've raised a very interesting question and that has to do with the um, long-term suitability of the Earth 
to harbor life. And you mentioned one issue, which is the stability of our sun to, pr to produce a luminosity at a stable level so that the temperature of the Earth would remain uh, within a small range, leaving liquid water viable on the Earth and Mars the same. Um, and th there are a whole suite of uh, criteria that must be met for the Earth to remain stably habitable. You mentioned one, that the sun has to be stable in its luminosity. It turns out the presence of our moon orbiting the Earth stabilizes the spin axis of the Earth, without which the spin axis of the Earth would wobble all around and we'd be pointed right at the sun some of the time. Jupiter plays a critical role in the habitability of the Earth. Jupiter serves as a great gravitational vacuum cleaner, essentially, sweeping out and cleansing the solar system from the asteroids and comets that would wipe us out as wiped out the dinosaurs. And there are many others. So you've touched on an interesting point. I mentioned the uh, need for the amount of water to be just as it is, and you've mentioned another one. It may be that the number of uh, properties of our Earth and its solar system that make it habitable are so numerous that habitable Earths are, are less common than we think. Uh, I wanted to address your other question, which is you know, why have I been doing this for 30 years and haven't bagged a single alien? The, um, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited. I think it's, this is a big question. Uh, it's worth more than 30 years of one's career. Um, and I don't think it's going to be me, actually. I think if I'm lucky, it'll be my students or my students' students. Or it'll take a few, many generations. If we're very lucky, we might find ET in our lifetimes. Um, but I think it, it's probably going to be a while. Um, and the, uh, some people are optimistic. Some people, it's just hard to say. Um, but it's, it's, it's very interesting for me because uh, we're not doing the same search that we did 30 years ago. We're always trying something new. The capabilities are doubling. We're, every year, the, we've got all kinds of new ideas. We're trying to get different frequencies, looking for pulse signals. So uh, I think it, it would be very, it would be hard to do the same thing for 30 years, but we try to launch a new search with a whole different strategy. Every year, we're trying something new. Um, and uh, we've got new telescopes and new ideas. And so, uh, and the other thing that is, that's exciting is that some of the technology that we've developed is now being used in a lot of different ways. Uh, Setting Home led to this whole concept of using your computer at home for a variety of scientific projects, not just SETI, but uh, might lead to some interesting cancer, uh, HIV drugs. Uh, people are using their computers now for a whole bunch of things. Um, people are using the instruments that we develop for SETI now, and almost all the radio observatories use the instruments that we develop. Uh, we, we made uh, maps of the galaxy with hydrogen, highest resolution maps. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that's come out of our research, even though we haven't bagged any aliens. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. I understand. Do you have a new search going on, the AstroPulse technology, which in addition to looking for SETI signs, might also find things like uh, a radiation burst from uh, an evaporating micro black hole? Yeah, so last year there was this incredible announcement of a, of a radio pulse that was so powerful, it saturated the amplifier when it came to the telescope, traveling a billion years. Uh, it's more than a billion light years away. And this thing had been traveling for a billion years, and it saturated the amplifier. Incredibly powerful pulse. Nobody knows what that is. Uh, some people think it might be ET. Some people think it might be a, a, a primordial black hole exploding, two neutron stars smacking into each other. We have no idea what it is. Some people think it's, uh, it's just interference, radio interference. Uh, and so we've been searching for these things at, at, with AstroPulse at Arecibo and at the Allen Telescope Array, trying to find more of them and figure out where they're coming from. I also wanted to take a moment to point out, in addition to uh, Dan, uh, that here uh, I think there are a number of remarkable people in the audience, and if she doesn't mind, I'm going to single one out, that uh, means that we have the two premier SETI searchers here in the room. Jill Tarter is uh, here, and you may uh, be familiar with her work. A character that was based on her is Ellie Arroway in the book and the movie Contact was uh, based on, uh, on, on a real-life SETI astronomer. Thank you for being here. Do we have a, yes, a question down here? Yeah, I want to um, propose a, uh, a, a solution to why uh, the Fermi paradox, where is everybody? And, and that is, uh, we, we think fairly conventionally, most of these things think they have a sort of a NASA point of view, of going with big rockets and traveling through space. But, uh, right, right now, 
we're getting on the verge of seeing other parts of the universe. So I mean, suppose we got into the quantum world, and we made a big penetration there, and we could travel into other dimensions. Then we, we, we might uh, find uh, a lot of things that were interesting, much more interesting than, than uh, NASA-type explorations, if you could visit other dimensions and travel around there. So it, it might be like, like uh, we're looking on the surface of the table or on a line on the edge of the table because we think that's the universe, but the universe is really a much more bigger dimensional thing and everybody's out there crawling and we're still back here on the, on, on the line. Yeah, I, I, I also want to point out another thing that, that the, uh, do the you fact have, that... Do you have a question for our guest? <laughs> I'm pointing that out. The, the other thing is that they, they posed a question so I'm giving an answer. The, the, uh, the, the other thing is uh, uh, looking out in, in, uh, around the world for a messiah is an old thing. You know, governments are always looking for things to do. Universities, big organizations, they always have to have a, a, some crusade to save the earth. So, so, so they're, they're looking for, for, for this thing which is supposed to be a messiah which will come and straighten us out. You know, <laughs> that, that's, uh, it's as old as, it's as, it's as old as Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I have, I have a question for you, Jeff. Uh, actually, two little questions. One was the fact that, 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 that and by the way, it's your team devised this, we're, we're the first team to discover any multiple star systems, multiple planets, uh, multiple planet star systems. Um, isn't it possible that in that gap between the gas giants and the, that there, and the, the rocky planets, that there might be something smaller that's too small to have a detectable wobble? Yeah, the, the exciting uh, fact of the matter is, is that our technology allows us to find Jupiter's, Saturn's, and Neptune-sized planets, but we can't yet discover the Earth's. So ironically, all the stars for which we don't discover any planets might be the ones with plenty of Earth's, and in that gap, there might be rocky, Earth-like planets. So it's, it's interesting that what we don't find might be the most exciting. And since you're measuring these really tiny Doppler shifts, aren't there, there must be other factors you must be taking into account, because it's not just a, a, an Earth that's set in, 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 in a place in the universe and that little that motion. There's also the motion of the Earth around the sun, our whole solar system through the galaxy, that whole solar system, not just the, the relative. So, how do you possibly take into account all those different yeah, the, motions? I'll just answer briefly that we measure these Doppler shifts from the platform that we call Earth, but the Earth is moving around the Sun, Sun is moving around the galaxy, the galaxy is even moving through the universe, and we can actually remove all of those effects using something that's actually quite glorious at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. They have a huge database and a co computer program that predicts for all time in the future, where the Earth will be, what its velocity will be, to plus or minus one millimeter per second. So incredible accuracy, and we use the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, ephemeris as it's called, to subtract the effects of our own motion. How, I wonder what extent they take that into account, the movement of our galaxy, the cluster of galaxies, the super cluster of I think clusters. those don't matter. <laughs> Not in this case. You never know, you yeah. never know. Uh, we have a question. Jeff, about, about halfway in your talk, you, I was struck by something. You made a calculation of how many stars there were in our Milky Way and said, suppose there were one million of them were suitable, etc. And that took me aback right away. I realized that was just an arbitrary number, but you later on mentioned the, um, leaving aside the possibility of intelligent life, if we define life in some, the best way we know, at least some kind of self-replicating something right. or other. Uh, at least analogous to DNA. We know that there are amino acids, you've shown those are around, right. but hasn't someone calculated the probability or the, of forming a some kind of self-replicating thing like DNA out of amino acids? That number might be such that rather than a million, you might be using something like 10 to the minus 12, and then we become a better explanation of why we aren't running to be. Well, you've raised an interesting question, and even though I'm wearing black and I'm painting myself as the pessimist, I've had quite a few cases where I gave a public talk like this, and there was a molecular biologist in the audience who would stand up at the end of my talk and say, you're way too optimistic that we don't know, as Dan mentioned, how life gets started. We have some ideas, but it's possible that the creation from the primordial soup of 
an organism that has a cell wall, some, something like mitochondria, a nucleus, that functions in a quite complex way, that those entities that we call primitive life or microbial life, they themselves might be quite rare. It yeah. might be rare that even with a apparently habitable world, that you even get kick-started in life. In which case, there might be another factor, as you say, of one in a million or so that should go into the Drake equation. There's, there's a, um, you, know, you and I are made of 20 amino acids, but there are hundreds of amino acids. And the fact that we're made of 20 uh, is probably just random that those little 20 that happen to be in the tide pool or whatever at the time. So you, you can imagine life made out of different amino acids. A lot of people think that life got started uh, as RNA, not DNA. So uh, that, that's a little easier to do, and that's probably what happened first, and that led to DNA later. Some people think it's not even based on atoms, uh, that you can have life uh, that's not based on molecules and atoms as we know, that, that you can have life on a neutron star made out of nuclear material. Uh, neutron star material uh, moves much faster, maybe a billion times faster, and, and uh, Robert Forward wrote a book called Dragon's Egg about life that evolves a billion times faster. So instead of taking five billion years to evolve like it happened on Earth, it, it evolves in five years. In which case, they kill themselves off in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult to communicate with them as well. We have a question. If you've seen any of the alien TV shows, how do we know when we really had an alien encounter? Um, so I, um, I'm pretty pessimistic that there have been alien encounters here on Earth. I think there's really no good evidence for it. And for hundreds of years, people saw angels. Um, and then when uh, uh, Jules Verne wrote about flying saucers and flying cigars, that's when people started seeing uh, things flying around in space. First they saw flying cigars, then they saw flying saucers, and people tend to see what's in the movies. Uh, the, the, you don't think it's possible that the aliens' technology is pacing hours? <laughs> Airships, <laughs> flying saucers. Yeah, I, I think, you know, some of it's real. People do see weather balloons and fun uh, military spacecraft, and they think it's a UFO. But a lot of it's uh, sort of imagined. Uh, it correlates very well with what's in popular culture, uh, and, uh, and some of it's deliberate hoaxes. People make these movies and things like that. And they go up into their attic and they found the models. That crop they circles, use. right? Uh, yeah, crop circles, they're a contest with the kids that make crop circles. <laughs> um, I had a question. Um, given a typical planet like Earth with you know, silica, <coughs> outer shell, uh, what type of, what would be the kind of energy one would expect to lift objects out of the gravity well? Just, for example, today on Earth, if we look forward, how many kilograms or how many, you know, how much mass can we move off the Earth beyond Earth's gravity? You mean with, uh, with, with, with whatever we have, ions, solar propulsion, yeah, mechanisms exactly. that we Chemical. have? I'm not really qualified to answer yeah, that so question. You know, know conventional that. spacecraft are several tons, but people are talking about space elevators to, to uh, Good point. get up yeah. uh, huge amounts of material very inexpensively. Uh, and so there may be ways to get off the Earth inexpensively, but right now it's incredibly expensive. And I, I really do want to reemphasize something Dan mentioned in one of his last slides. Uh, there, there are many people, engineers in particular, hunting for better propulsion mechanisms so that we can send ourselves and our corp corporeal selves to the stars. And right now, the only uh, propulsion mechanism that I've heard about that has some chance of success are these solar sails, mm -hmm. where you don't have to carry the fuel with you, whether it's chemical or nuclear, but instead you use the uh, radiation pressure from s s sunlight or maybe a laser that's powered by sunlight to push the spacecraft away. You just wouldn't want to get stuck in the horse latitudes equidistant from a lot of stars, yeah, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, one, th one thought is that uh, certain things like a space elevator, that, that the science is very doable, but it's an extreme challenge uh, engineering-wise, you could easily imagine another civilization that would devote the resources that we've devoted to the military to exploration of space. We'd have a space elevator if we just threw a few billion dollars at it. It's, there's certain things that we could do that are strictly um, problems that would be resolved by throwing some money at them. I agree. Yeah. Although I'm actually not a big fan of 
spending a lot of money putting people in space right now. I mean, I think Jeff is right that in the long run, you'd want to have people on Mars, so when they read the newspaper, they say, oh, Mar gee, Marge, you know, Earth blew itself up today, then that's okay. But, but I think right now, uh, the, the, there, NASA's putting too much money into the Mars space program, into the people, putting people in space, and that there's very little science. If you're interested in science, there's very little science in people in space. Uh, although in the long run that may be beneficial for our species. Manifest destiny. When you're looking at stars, I mean, there's a thing, you can find a planet, but if you don't find a planet, is that, you know, the question is, is because your instruments aren't good enough. Let's say we take the 100 closest stars and we really look at them hard. If we looked at them hard enough and, and just with those 100, what, how sure are we that they do or don't have planets and are we waiting for better technology, better telescopes and everything else? So that, that's something that Jill Tarter is an expert in. Uh, she's focused most of her life at, at looking at, I think, 700 stars extremely carefully. Jill, do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, well, Jeff can uh, amplify on this. Unfortunately, the closest 100 stars are mostly in dwarfs. They're very small stars. There's a big active debate in the community whether those small stars could be suitable hosts for habitable planets. That's an open question. Um, on the other hand, those are exactly the stars, being small, that are most easily tugged by smaller planets. And so, what fraction of your list actually has the, the M dwarfs on it? I mean, well, we're, we're so monitoring about 120 of these small M dwarf stars. Yeah. And they are exciting. I can't help but echo what Jill is suggesting here. One of the things that, I mean, there are two great properties of the smallest stars. They're numerous, the, of the nearest 100 stars, two-thirds of them are these small M dwarfs. I also like one aspect of them, which is they don't emit much ultraviolet or X-ray uh, light after the first billion years or so. They become very quiescent stars, emitting mostly infrared light, a little bit of visible light, and that may promote the survival of delicate organic molecules that actually break apart uh, with UV or X-ray fluxes. So M dwarfs have some uh, beneficial properties. Thank you. Um, I think we only have time for another question or two if we keep them short. Um, you wanna? So my, my question is going to sound a little bit like a hostile question, but I'm a big fan of SETI. I want to say that first. Um, one of the criteria for an hypothesis to be scientific is that it be falsifiable, that there be a criterion by which you are able to say, our hypothesis, our hypothesis has been disproved. So I have a kind of two-part question about that. One of them is, what criteria would you accept for disproving the hypothesis that there are communicating intelligent civilizations in our galaxy, let's limit it to the galaxy. And the other question has to do with the, uh, the wonderful graphic that um, you showed, um, Mr. Wertheim, showing the amount of search space that has already been looked at, so to speak. The, the question is, can, what kind of an upper limit can you now put on the number of communicating civilizations? Yeah. Obviously, there is not one per star. We can say there are not 300 billion communicating civilizations in the galaxy. What's the upper limit you could place right now, yeah. assuming they're evenly split, spread? Yeah, I, I, it's an interesting question. Uh, right now, the limits that we can put are, are, are not very interesting. We can say that there are no incredibly powerful ci civilizations sending us radio or laser signals at, uh, during the one or two minutes that we happen to be looking in that direction uh, at the frequency that we were looking at with the signal type that we happen to be examining that minute. So it, uh, it's not, there, we're not really able to rule out those kinds of civilizations. I think one thing that we could rule out are the kind of super civilizations that Jeff was talking about that conquer the galaxy, that build self-replicating probes, that just put stuff everywhere. Um, we could maybe rule out civilizations that, that are broadcasting incredibly powerful beacons that are just always there, maybe at television frequency. But, but there, unfortunately, we, we can't really rule out very much right now. And, I, and the problem, as you were pointing out, is that we're going to be able to do more and more searches uh, that are more thorough and the limits will get better, but only on the kind of signals that we're looking for. So if they're broadcasting on tachyons or uh, using some technique that we haven't figured out yet, some new physics that we figured out, it really doesn't rule out very much. 
I'm afraid we don't have any uh, more time for questions. However, our, our guests will be available just outside the lecture hall. We have an incredible program today with other, of other presentations, including one coming up right now on uh, relativity. But they will be available for more questions out in the lobby. And um, how about a nice round of applause for Jeff Marcy and Dan Wertheimer? Thank you very much.